Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Professor Fiona Devine, and I am head of Alliance Manchester Business School here at the University of Manchester. So thank you very much for all of you for joining us here this afternoon. It is great to see everybody come together uh, to hear from one of our talented colleagues here at the Business School. Uh, and so this afternoon we are joined by Professor Kieran Flanagan, I hope he likes that sound, <laughs> who is a Professor of Science and Technology Policy here at the Business School. And as I say, we are joined by all of you face to face, delighted to have you here, but we also have an online audience and we do like to ensure that we have uh, the opportunity for participation from both audiences here today. So this afternoon's lecture is part of our original thinking series where we hear from new and newly promoted professors in AMBS who are delivering their inaugural lectures. Uh, and as I say, it is lovely to see you all here uh, and especially also to welcome the online audience. Now, Kieran was promoted last summer to Professor of Science and Technology Policy and is also a long-standing member of the Manchester Institute of Innovation Research. Kieran has published conceptual and empirical work on a wide range of issues in science, technology and innovation policy. He is an active commentator on science, technology and economic development policy and has been quoted widely in a, in a range of publications. Formerly a contributor and co-editor of The Guardian's newspaper's political science science policy blog, Kieran sometimes still writes at the blog's new home on the research professional website. And indeed, before I joined the business school, I knew of Kieran from, from particularly uh, The Guardian newspapers and the work that he did there. Kieran teaches on science and technology policy, science society issues and innovation policy courses. He is also heavily involved in executive education through the suite of Manchester Innovation Institute of Innovation's Research Executive Short Courses uh, and courses also offered here in the Business School. Kieran is currently Associate Director for Research Impact and Knowledge Exchange here in the Business School. Before that, he held a position as Director of Postgraduate Talk Programmes for the School. Uh, responsible for our extensive portfolio of specialist master's programmes, and he has also previously acted as director of undergraduate programmes, so also an incredible citizen uh, within the school. The topic of this afternoon's lecture is what's next for UK science and innovation policy, and the lecture will examine what progress has been made in this agenda, what its prospects are, and in doing so, we'll draw out some broader questions about why we fund research and what we hope to gain from it. So as always, there's going to be plenty of time towards the end of today's session for questions here um, in the, from the room. It raise your hand in the normal way. Uh, and for those of you who are online, please type them into the chat function at the bottom of your screen, uh, and we will try to pull them in uh, as we go through the event uh, this afternoon. The discussion and questions today will be facilitated by Professor Luke Giorgio, Deputy President and Deputy Vice Chancellor here at the University of Manchester, and also a Professor of Science and Technology Policy and Management in the MIOIR in the Business School. So like me, I'm sure you're very keen to get started, so let me hand over to Professor Fanagan. Thank you very much, Julia. Thanks, Fiona, and thanks everybody for coming. And for those of you who joined online, thanks for that as well. Um, let's see if this. Yeah. So I'm going to try and be more disciplined than I usually am when I talk. Um, might mean I'll go a little bit faster than I normally go. So um, if anything's unclear, just stop me and ask or ask a question at the end. Um, what I want to do today is is very much in line with the, the summary that uh, Fiona's just um, given. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the challenges of policy complexity as they um, affect this domain of science, technology, and innovation policy. And that's a kind of academic perspective, I guess. And that's 
um, talking about my own work and work with, with, with colleagues here. Um, but most of the talk I want to do, I, I want to focus on um, complexity in practice, taking the case of um, UK science, technology and innovation policy. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try and talk a little bit about how we got to where we are with UK STI policy um, to identify um, several myths and fallacies that seem to uh, inform STI policy debates, and then to end by uh, talking a little bit about um, what comes next. Um, and I think maybe just to start with, I think a, a kind of interesting place to start is from the realization that there's a kind of paradox around innovation. Um, there's never really been more active attention to making innovation happen. There's innovation policies, we've had active innovation policies for decades. There's whole industries of policy analysis um, and of innovation intermediation and innovation promotion. Yet at the same time, many economists are arguing that we're seeing a, a slowdown or a stagnation in innovation. And whilst I think that actually that debate makes us up a lot of different things and we could have a completely different conversation about that debate, I think it does raise an interesting uh, question that whilst we don't have the counterfactual, um, perhaps promoting, encouraging innovation for social and economic uh, welfare is a little harder than perhaps sometimes it looks. So I said I'd, I'd give a little perspective um, from my own research. So I, I, I want to talk about um, uh, a couple of um, publications um, very, very briefly, uh, both with Elvira Yara, who's here, and um, the first one also involving uh, a colleague from Portugal, Manuel Laranja. Um, and in, in these two papers, we tried to give an account of um, complexity and how it affects uh, science, technology, and innovation policy, um, and what that means for um, both policy studies and policy making. Um, very pleased that this work has had quite some academic impact. Um, surprisingly, in all kinds of areas, uh, energy policies, sustainability transitions policy, um, many other policy literatures, um, but also hopefully in the innovation policy literature that it was targeted at. And, and hopefully we've had some uh, impact on policymakers as well with, with this work. Um, so these papers try and emphasize um, some things that STI policy thinking tends to downplay. Um, for instance, the agency that a wide range of actors have in setting policy agendas and shaping and implementing policies and their impacts, um, in the flexibility with which policies can be interpreted. Um, policies are not stable, discrete tools from a kind of policy toolbox. Um, they're actually a kind of social technology and they're open to interpretation and flexible implementation. Speaking of implementation, um, in line with the policy studies literature, we emphasize the importance of implementation, um, both in the sense that context matters, policy outcomes, but also in the, in the sense, uh, the important sense that actors also matter, uh, policy targets, policy implementers have a big influence on how policies turn out. Um, we also talk about the implications of, of change and the fact that actors learn and change their behavior over time. And that isn't just policymakers learning in the sense um, of uh, Stan and Luke's idea of the adaptive policymaker, which was one of the starting points for this, uh, uh, this, this strand of, of work, but in the sense that everybody learns over time, all those targeted for behavioral change by policies change their behavior over time in response to learning. They learn to play the game. And that means that the effects of policies at different times can be very different. And then there are tensions and trade-offs in what we call policy mixes between competing rationales or justifications for policy interventions. So between the ends of innovation policies and between the means of innovation policies and how all these things interact in, 
in mixes of policies that have been perhaps introduced at different times for different purposes to solve different problems. So we're very much trying to build on this idea of the adaptive policymaker and in fact coming to the conclusion that policymakers really have no choice but to be adaptive. They can only ever be adaptive in, in, in being confronted with these kinds of complexity. So what does this mean for, um, oh. there is some text on, on that slide. Um, what does this mean for STI policy debates? Well, there have been many calls for better coordination or better intelligence policy. Um, but with these means and means ends confusions, um, with the diverse, sometimes only partially articulated and often potentially contradictory goals that public policy is expected to address, um, rational design and coordination, but also evaluation of complex policies. It's always likely to be challenging. And things like trends like the dispersal of power away from national governments and their agencies uh, through the processes of multi-level governance only make that more so. So we've argued that policy researchers in this context need to be a little bit more humble in their expectations about what they can achieve with policy research. Um, and perhaps we shouldn't rush um, so much to prescription, but we can, I think, play a useful role in helping to uncover hidden assumptions and foregrounding where choices have been made or could have been made, perhaps made, been made differently in what are otherwise often presented as inevitable trajectories of development. And at the same time, we also need to be attuned to the real lives of policies out there in the wild. And in that sense, we've called for more uh, the accumulation of, of, of what we call appreciative policy histories, kind of rich, detailed case studies of the genesis of policies and their unfolding over time. And in that spirit, um, I want to use the rest of my talk to examine the context, history, um, and some decision points around UK STI policy. So a little bit of context, it's not really a history lecture, I'm not a historian, um, so I should qualify immediately with that. Um, science policy in the UK, you can argue, um, and I think historians like David Edgerton would argue this, um, it is a product of fears of relative industrial decline, uh, at least from the end of the 19th century, and especially after the First World War. But it's also arguably a product of the wartime experience in the 20th century, mobilizing science towards national needs. Um, so that's both the First World War and especially the Second World War. And it's also the product of the growth of interest in active science policy in the post-war Cold War context. For instance, through debates and um, developments in the OECD, the, the Rich Countries Economic Policy Club. But all of that means there isn't a single UK science policy. Uh, the UK came out of the Second World War and into the Cold War with a very large defense oriented R&D system. So a great focus on the goals and missions of the state, especially as um, defined in the Cold War. Universities up until that middle point of the 20th century were really funding their research mainly through their own income and through grants from foundations and charities. Um, and you see progressive change through the, especially second half of the 20th century with more active involvement of government funding research in universities. Um, but it's still important to keep in mind the scale of that other, other kind of portfolio of research oriented towards defense and other national security um, needs. So what have been the policy trends? So I'm gonna skip forward a little bit. Since the 60s, I've identified a few policy trends on this slide. I'll talk through them very briefly. We could identify others. But there's perhaps some key things, some key developments. Increasing efforts to change the balance away from defense to civil orientation for government funding for applied research and development. 
from the 1960s onwards, think about um, Harold Wilson's white heat of technology. And indeed that's achieved over the following decades, although not through rebalancing from defense to civil R&D, but simply through the decline of uh, UK defense uh, activities. Um, an increased perception from the 70s and into the 80s that science policy in the UK is about managing relative decline as more and more nations become more and more active in global science. And the UK is trying to uh, maintain its share with straightened resources. And partly as a result of that, we see deliberate attempts to increase the geographical concentration of university research in the 1980s onwards. And of course, that's the origin of research selectivity, which we see today through the operation for the QR formula that's uh, allocated according to REF results. At the same time, we see more or less deliberate attempt to encourage universities to increase international student income to complement declining teaching funding and to cross subsidize that research base. And then very importantly, we have a deliberate attempt in the late 1980s under Thatcher to shift the balance of government investment in research from applied to what we might call basic or investigator driven research. Uh, quite an unusual shift that's been documented in detail by the historian John Agar in, in, a, in a really good book on Thatcher's science policy. Alongside that, real rise of interest in commercialization and the transfer of technology from that basic research base into um, commercial application into industry from the 1980s onwards. And a lot of that is looking towards the US as an exemplar. In the 80s and 90s, we see transformation and privatization of many major government research laboratories. And more broadly, continuing decline in the research and development spending of other government departments outside the core science budget. So that kind of science spending that government departments did to support their own goals and missions is in decline and continues to be in decline. And then perhaps um, kind of most recently, another important milestone perhaps is the introduction of kind of indirect incentives for um, innovation and in particular the introduction of R&D tax incentives in the UK, um, which have, that have since then grown to be very, very significant uh, by international standards. And what's been the result of all of this? Some charts, um, uh, most people in the room will be aware of this. UK R&D intensity, public and private. Remember, most R&D spending is spent by companies to support the development of of, of newer improved products and services. Um, and that private R&D spending, but also the public R&D spending uh, are relatively weak by international standards. And the UK has been kind of bobbing along with 1.69, um, 1.7% of GDP <coughs> accounted for by R&D spending public and private for several decades. Investment by Companies in R&D are stagnated and is dominated by a few key sectors like pharmaceuticals um, uh, and uh, aerospace. And maybe there are some measurement issues there uh, in relation to the service economy. Interestingly, foreign investors have often tended to show a different attitude to R&D investment to UK owners and UK investors. So, um, the UK has seen significant FDI in R&D. Um, uh, these are quite old figures now, it stops at 2012, but I think you get some sense of the, the, um, the level of interest in investing in, uh, in R&D from overseas investors in the UK. And this is a chart of total public expenditure on research and innovation activities by government, uh, so public expenditure per capita for 2013, 2014, it's a heat map. So the darker the red, um, the higher the per capita expenditure. And you can see, um, well, you, perhaps you can't quite see, um, for the benefit of the people joining online, I am in the room, I'm trying to uh, move my fingers around where Greater London is on this chart, which is a little bit darker than the already dark southeast of England on the 
fairly dark uh, east of England. Scotland also per capita, um, very research intensive. So public research spending is very concentrated in the UK. So over the time that I, I've just talked about, technology policy seen as a subset of industrial or perhaps defense industrial policy largely gave way to a kind of sector technology and place blind innovation policy, a generic innovation policy focused on efforts to promote technology transfer and commercialization of basic research findings by incentivizing and supporting academic industry interaction, increased patenting, etc. And the changes that I've described have left the UK looking, you know, quite unlike many comparator countries in terms of the balance between public funding for investigator driven versus problem driven research. And also, therefore, in terms of the ecosystem in which public research is carried out, investigator driven science in the UK, it conducted largely in the universities and funded largely now by UKRI as the kind of umbrella organization that brings together the different research councils and funding agencies, has had to become a kind of Swiss army knife of STI policy, expected to solve any and all social and economic problems, simply because the other parts of the system have atrophied. When new kinds of organisation have been introduced in recent years, I think, for instance, of the uh, Catapult Network, Applied Research uh, uh, Institutes, it's so far been fairly tentative and subcritical. And as I said, um, with that heat map uh, a moment ago, the geography of all this public spending is also noteworthy. And many people, including colleagues like Rich Jones, have, have talked a lot about that. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about myths. Um, and I'll just talk about, I'll just identify two myths in particular. Um, one all my colleagues here will be familiar with, um, and that is, is what we might call the linear model fallacy, um, which comes alongside a myth around innovation intermediation. Technological innovation, and we know this from decades of innovation studies, isn't generally a step-by-step -step linear process from scientific discoveries through commercialization to successful application. Yet, we all act as if it were. Efforts to increase the efficiency and productivity of this linear process continue. Um, we disregard the other important but less direct impacts of research and their social, economic, and spatial implications. For instance, R&D is the absorptive capacity to understand, evaluate, and apply knowledge generated elsewhere, or R&D activity as an attractor of creative people, as an incubation environment for uh, highly skilled people and for the generation of new organizations. Innovation isn't this linear step-by-step -step process. It's a process of bringing market opportunities and technological potentials together. And science provides a resource base, that both a human resource base, an infrastructural resource base, and a kind of reservoir of knowledge. But a kind of substantial industry has grown up around tech transfer and commercialization. Um, and whilst those activities are valuable in themselves, I think it does contribute to a sense in which we're cognitively, institutionally, and in human capital terms, locked into a kind of narrow linear tech transfer paradigm. And when I say human capital, by that I mean that because the tech transfer and commercialization activities have been so significant for so many decades, it supplies a lot of the people in the system. So it's not surprising that that thinking continues to dominate. Second myth I wanted to briefly talk about is related to the first, and that's what we might call the closed system fallacy, and, and, and it's related to what might tentatively call techno nationalism. Science policy debates tend to treat science and technology as a kind of zero sum competition between nations, or if you want to look at subnational level, between places. But scientific research is a globally distributed process albeit, of course, very concentrated in certain nodes. It's a networked, distributed process. Even if innovation were a linear step-by-step -step process, 
Why would we expect it all to happen in the same place? And in fact, a key reason why we invest in basic discovery science or investigative driven science is because it helps us remain part of and able to draw from those global knowledge networks. So spatial proximity, of course, is important for innovation, but it's not the only kind of proximity that matters for innovation. And kind of relational knowledge um, networks are probably going to be a lot more important in many cases. And there's a, there's a geometric aspect to this as well. If you think of any technology area, more money will be being spent on that technology area outside the UK than inside the UK. Okay, so some simple, um, uh, simple, perhaps obvious um, points there. What does this mean for the UK? Where are we going? What might come next? Um, we, we live in interesting times for sure. Um, Boris Johnson was not the first conservative leader in, in recent times to stand in front of that train in the Ma Manchester Museum of Science and Industry and give a heavyweight speech about um, the role of science and innovation in, in, a, in a national and, and regional economic development. And um, there have been major commitments from uh, the Theresa May and the Boris Johnson governments in terms of using science and innovation to help um, revitalize industries or to rebalance the UK's economy. And we've seen um, an industrial strategy come and go and be replaced with a kind of glossy pamphlet with nice pictures and not much content called Build Back Better. Um, and mo more recently, we've seen a kind of uh, a slightly more substantial leveling of white paper um, with commitments in there. We've seen a commitment from the government to create a new research agency, which I'll say more about in a moment, although some, some teething problems with that. Um, so so what's, what's going on here? Um, perhaps most interestingly, the May and then the Johnson governments have returned to a commitment to try and achieve, um, to try and meet a target of GDP um, devoted to R&D spending. So that will be public and private R&D spending, 2.4% target, um, which would bring us kind of, you know, an average position amongst international peers. But it's still quite a stretch target going from that 1.7% that we've been stuck for a very long time. Um, public spending on R&D is due to grow to 20 billion pounds by 2024, including boosts for applied research and we're promised um, some new money into that kind of declining, that ailing government departmental science and technology base. There's been in the leveling up white paper, a modest commitment to rebalancing government R&D spending outside the greater Southeast of England. Many people have pointed out that actually it doesn't don't take very much to achieve the rebalancing that's been offered. Um, and we still don't know what it will look like. Um, and, and how seriously we should take it and how it fits in with other longer standing policies around concentration and selectivity. And as I said, we also have um, the promise of an, a UK version of DARPA. DARPA is the, UK, uh, the US um, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which you might know for such innovations as Big Dog, the big robot there, and the internet. So you might have heard of that. Um, so the UK is creating um, Largely at the behest of Dominic Cummings, uh, something called ARIA, Advanced Research and Invention Agency, I think it is. But what is for how it connects to the kinds of things that DARPA has historically done um, is a little unclear. It's not even clear really which DARPA they're trying to emulate because DARPA's models have changed very much in the decades that it's existed. And it's also done different things in different technology groups. But still a lot of promise for a kind of high risk, high reward public funding agency outside of the bureaucratic structures of, of UK research and innovation. So where, where are we? I think there are still challenges around a lack of clarity and competing views 
around what innovation spending should do. So for instance, I constantly hear disagreements amongst different parties about what Innovate UK should do. Innovate UK is the agency within UKRI that, that funds essentially innovation projects in, in businesses. Some would argue its role should be to act as a kind of technological research council. Others, especially since the creation of UKRI, see uh, as ideal to play a kind of end of pipe commercialization role for publicly funded basic science. But many politicians and some officials seem to also see it as a kind of generic business support agency. Um, those three interpretations are very different and they're not necessarily compatible or complementary with each other. We've also um, heard that the UK is setting up, well, has already set up an office for science and technology strategy to set a new kind of uh, high level um, strategy for um, technological development in the UK, distinct from the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology, which has existed for a long time and its predecessors, um, like ACUS. Um, and this Office of Science and Technology Strategy seems to be linked with a kind of revival of what we might call the technological sovereignty agenda, the idea that we need to think um, about um, national security and national competitiveness when we decide what priorities to, what technological priorities to pursue, that there are some technologies that we will, as a nation, want to have control over, want to be self-sufficient in some way. And then, of course, there are the impacts of Brexit, um, future of UK participation in Horizon Europe, um, looking bleaker by the day, um, but also things like the, 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 the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, which, which replaces the structural funds, um, which were used very uh, effectively in the UK um, to uh, support science and innovation related infrastructure spending. Um, I am nearly finished. Um, meanwhile, the UK science space is very strong. Lots of evidence to show that. Um, but the UK continues to suffer from a lack of interest in private companies in innovation outside of a few star firms and sectors. Despite the available supply of highly skilled human resources from the science space, UK-owned firms seem to have a problem with the idea of investing in innovation by investing in R&D. As I say, maybe it's different in some surface sectors. We don't really know enough about that, I think. I would say that decades of focus on technology transfer have failed to make much of a dent in this problem. And it feels to me like the supply of still more science or still more scientists and engineers or still more efforts on knowledge transfer can't by themselves fix the problems that we have because they're on the demand side. They're on the industry side and they're to do with the industry's attitude towards technology and innovation. Now the British state used to play a significant role in articulating demand for technological development in the UK, especially, but not only through that defense activity that I talked about at the start talk, so we can raise the question, where will the demand for innovative technologies and applications that will shape and call innovation come from in, in the post-Brexit, post-COVID economy? Um, and then this is uh, an ultimate slide. Um, it's easy to forget that increasing the geographical concentration of public research spending has been a deliberate goal of UK science policy since the 1980s. Uh, a goal founded in the context of managing decline. We seem to have collectively forgotten that. Um, we're not apparently in the process of managing decline any longer. So it's legitimate to question this goal. Um, but UK r and is not just imbalanced geographically, it's also imbalanced in terms of the emphasis on investigator driven science versus perhaps what we might call technological R&D. With a world-class science base, but too little public investment and too little private investment in technological development. The percentage of the economy devoted to R&D stubbornly refuses to rest by huge boosts in R&D tax credits, tax incentives. And we have to ask questions about the deadweight cost of those tax incentives and potentially the level of fraud that's probably going on there. 
The last time the UK was much above 2% um, of GDP devoted to R&D, um, we had major nationalized industries with big R&D activities. We had a whole uh, suite of government labs. Um, we had big civil technology programs as well as big defense R&D spending. Um, and today we've seen global trends towards decentralization, outsourcing, offshoring of corporate R&D, growing importance, as I showed, of foreign-owned R&D investment in the UK relative to UK-owned investment. We've seen the collapse in productivity of the big pharma traditional R&D model, the rise of new actors in private R&D, such as um, contract research firms, very important in the UK uh, situation. Um, and most importantly, of course, the UK is an 80% services economy. Yeah, there's next to no discussion of what services innovation policies might look like. So, so some thoughts to end. I think decades of promising to address challenges of national economic competitiveness through scientific research have led to boom bust cycles in funding but also pressures for ever more monitoring and accountability and more and more emphasis on knowledge exchange and technology transfer. So maybe it's time to think about doing things differently. So there's a question about how far we can grow applied investment in R&D on the public side with the science base that's so concentrated in universities. Universities have to be part of the solution there because there simply isn't another population of major research and performing um, organizations. And I think there are lessons to be learned undoubtedly from the US where major research universities do a lot of applied research. Our colleagues at Spru famously talked about talent, not technology. The role of the science base is in producing people in absorptive capacity. And that also counts as our entry ticket to global knowledge networks. And there remains this tension between a nationalistic policy, but also lobbying rhetoric around science funding, which presents science as a zero sum race for national competitiveness. This is the reality of a globally distributed scientific enterprise. And this is complicated by the rise of these new techno nationalisms that I mentioned. And what do we do about the demand side. Is that one of the fabled Brexit opportunities that we, we heard so much about? I haven't seen much detail. Of. And I think here there are opportunities around the challenges and the problems faced by the state and how the state chooses to address them. And that's something that Elvira and I are, are working on in, in other research with, with other colleagues. Okay, and I'm going to stop now and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Kira. I think we're meant to relax in these chairs. Yes. If you can relax. <laughs> Try. Just um, water as well. Well, th thank you for that wonderful exposition of uh, uh, 50 years, I think it was, that you were, you were covering, Ish. possibly 60. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, not, not quite that long, but I. Uh, I, I, I did want to say at the beginning what pleasure it's been to see you progress from being a, a brilliant but very challenging master's student <laughs> through <laughs> all of the stages that you could be in this place to the uh, internationally renowned professor sitting next to me today. So that's great. So let, 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 let me come to the business uh, of, of the day. I'm, I'm going to take questions both from the room and from our online audience, but uh, I did want to start with one of my own. So I was particularly struck with your your slide um, of policy trends with all, all, all of the boxes, because I think, as as you were hinting in your final remarks, uh, every one of those boxes is uh, a key to policy today. If you invert it, 
it's exactly the opposite mm -hmm. of what people are wanting to do now. Mm -hmm. So we could see uh, a very likely trend from civil back to defense. Uh, we, we, we could, uh, uh, the, the ideology of managing decline has turned into an ideology of boastfulness, global science, superpower mm -hmm. is the, the, the key phrase that we keep, uh, keep hearing. I, I, I could run through all, all of them. I think uh, the, the move that you already described from basic back to an applied emphasis mm -hmm. in the growing leveling up funds uh, and uh, I, I'm not sure tax credits have been challenged yet, but uh, they deserve to be. Seems like Rishi so, Sunak is challenging them, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, why have we got it so fundamentally wrong? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> how long has everybody got? Um, I think it's a really interesting. It's a really interesting question. A lot of these choices were made, obviously, in very different contexts. Some of them are also just contingent. You know, and choices could have been different at different times. Um, I think, however, perhaps especially in UK science, technology, and innovation policy, there is a there is a, a kind of tendency for things to institutionalize. So I think something's institutionalized very quickly, um, and then it's very very hard to see. That the origin of that institution was a choice made for a contingent reason, you know, even 10 years ago, never mind 20, 30, or 40 years ago. Um, I think uh, perhaps the way we manage our um, policy bureaucracies do, doesn't help. You know, there's a constant churn of, of policymakers. So, the UK civil servants are by and large very impressive people, but they're in post for two or three years before they move to a different job and they have to learn a whole new area of policy, a whole new area of, of society or economy, a whole new set of problems and a whole new language and idea, a kind of set of um, research ideas from the kind of the supply of people like us who are supplying um, arguments and ideas. I think that probably has played a very important, a very important um, uh, Beyond that, I don't know, maybe you have some, some ideas of your own, actually. Uh, well, I, I, first of all, I agree with both the points you, you've made, although I think the institutionalization conceals another thing that we often have quite a good policy idea that don't do it properly, don't spend enough on it, don't follow yeah, it through. Sure. So it's a kind of false institutionalization sometimes. I think that's really interesting. I think, it's, I, I think you mentioned how subcritical the catapults are and also how we bizarrely decided to create, like, you know, seven or eight at the same time rather than do one or two and then like, let them grow all the time. And I think you're absolutely right. There are many examples of that. If you go back in the, in the, you know, the, 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 the 2000s and the 90s of uh, uh, innovations introduced by kind of innovation policy makers, but that were really sort of, sort of critical. So I'm sure that's part of it. Anyway, let, let me uh, open up to the room. Uh, start on the left, Joe. Yeah. Uh, Kieran, thanks. Uh, really um, concise and uh, distilled. Uh, big story. Uh, and uh, well, you mentioned service innovation. Otherwise, they uh, like social sciences and humanities didn't really get a look in. Mm -hmm. I began to think about this. And then I reflected about 15 years ago, we were both uh, traveling around the remote regions of Eastern Europe, if you remember, mm -hmm. on an innovation regional policy uh, mm -hmm. program. And what you find is obviously, you know, Eastern Slovakia and so on, they're not going to do big science in the way that we understand it, but they've got very practical problems which need to be addressed. And so that kind of turns around the agenda for innovation, it's, you know, not so much STI, but SSI, social and societal, so called. Uh, and um, so that is maybe you know something that is for remote regions out there, not necessarily for the Golden Triangle here. But then, are there other currents in the debate uh, and the policy mix that are then pushing towards that side of things? I wonder. Uh, and um, you know, looking at Greater Manchester as our kind of laboratory on the doorstep, uh, you see all kinds of pressures. We need knowledge. We need innovation. We need this. So that. Big challenges here. 
and, and so on. So what are those prospects coming from sort of left of stage, <laughs> uh, you know, that could potentially become really big issues in the coming years? A really good question, Joe, thanks. Um, I do remember traveling around Eastern Europe um, doing regional innovation policy evaluation. Um, so in the UK definition of science, that includes social science and humanities research. So I mean, I'm not deliberately excluding it, although I did talk a lot about technological innovation, so I did narrow it in that sense. I think even to technological innovation, social sciences and humanities research are extremely relevant. Um, uh, but in a way, I think perhaps the question that you're asking is a little bit different, is about, you know, kind of um, knowledge supply versus demand for knowledge. And um, I think I tried to hint at the end, and I don't want to say too much about this because I suspect a colleague might talk about this in, in their inaugural lecture, but we're working at the moment on, um, uh, you know, how, because all, all not, not every place, has access to world-class leading science, but every place has got specific problems and challenges, um, which in some dimensions will be felt in other places as well. So places, regions, cities um, should potentially be able to use problems and challenges as a means to pull um, innovation, perhaps through judicious use of the Public procurement, uh, regulatory sandpits, other kinds of project living labs, those kinds of things, and, and we've been writing about a paper in uh, regional studies recently, which tries to map out some of these potential um, activities that the state is already involved in, is, is, is doing all the time, which could be um, managed slightly differently to to try and um, uh, use this. Uh, kind of portfolio of problems and challenges to, to, to pull innovation in some ways. So it's kind of a, a very different idea of innovation policy, but I think it's perhaps more genuinely problem driven than a lot of the rhetoric around challenges and missions, which is actually still just economic policy, but let's justify it with this mission or that mission, and that will get us more innovation, more technology, more economic growth. I'm not sure if I've answered your question. But. So the answer is watch this space. Yeah. Well, maybe watch this space <laughs> to some extent, but but I think, yeah, we, we, we need to, to know more about what places are actually doing, what regions are actually trying. We, we, we also published a, a paper, which is a case of a, a Spanish region, which has used all kinds of different public demands and needs to try and um, uh, stimulate the development of a, a UAV, uh, uncrewed aerial vehicles um, uh, a, a, a kind of, sector in, in that region with no previous track record of aerospace and innovation. So, and that's a really interesting attempt, really ambitious attempt, but it's too early to see how, how, how whether it succeeded or not. So we need to watch this space in, in, the, in the case of cases like that. We need to follow a lot of cases a, a, a lot more, but we can, we can of course make suggestions about what place to make might try. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, no, I don't know anything about science policy, but that was that was a really helpful entree to it. Um, and I wondered, you know, you did have a lot of time to talk about the uh, global context, but that slide of South Korea really high GDP in Finland. Yep. Is yep. that what what do the South Koreans do in terms of government policy? Has it been very consistent since the war in terms of you know from nothing completely flattened to being Something incredible in terms of innovation. Yeah. So it would be very consistent. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, that's a, an input measure. So it's 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 R and D spending. So and it doesn't necessarily equate to social or economic welfare. But um, so I was assuming that, that proviso. It's not necessarily a, a tracking innovation either. You know. So in some places, it might simply cost more to to, to get the same output. That's one possibility. Um, uh, South Korea has um, put in huge amounts of effort uh, to, uh, as a developmental state to build technological capacity and that R&D, the emphasis of R&D is so different from the emphasis in the UK. The institutions in which it happens are very different you know, um, from, from the UK, um, public and private to some extent. Um, uh, South Korea now is trying to catch up on the basic science side um, uh, on the, in the scope, but they didn't start with that. That they started with, with 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 learn fast, learn, adopt, and improve 
um, existing technologies. And, 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 and so it's not just how much you spend, but, but where you spend it on how you spend it. And I think that always gets lost in, and I'm guilty of that in this presentation, it gets lost in, in these kinds of presentations when you talk about R&D spend and, uh, and, and inputs. Um, can we take a couple of questions from our online audience? Yeah, so there's a question from Sunil. He says, um, basic research takes years for any radi radical output, so increasing R&D spend, will in increasing R&D spend be useful when the focus is on fast publications and when we don't have the heavyweight industrial research players such as ICI? Yeah, I think I think that I think that's a good question. I think that there are several different issues raised in that question. I think um, in those instances where basic research leads directly to an innovation, it does take a long time. That's not the only way, and usually not the most important way that basic research supports innovation. And the other ways often don't take such a long time. Um, the basic, you know, a leading edge scientific research base is where we train our scientists and engineers. Um, it's where we incubate new companies, uh, startups and spin outs. It, it's, it's where we have infrastructure that allows us to investigate new questions that might come from industry or from, from practice, from the, 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 the real world outside the, the university. Um, so it, it pr provides, uh, it, it plays a lot of other roles which might actually have quicker inputs. But, but in terms of the, 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 um, uh, the, 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 the sub-question about um, pressures for, for fast output and those kinds of things, I think there's a huge debate around the productivity of science. I mentioned at the start the, the, the kind of secular stagnation hypothesis, people um, arguing about slowdown in innovation. One, one set of theories around that is about kind of declining scientific productivity. And, and, and maybe that's due to some institutional um, problems in, in science. And, and, and I don't want to minimize those. We've just actually, I teach like an 11 week course on those. Um, uh, so if you want to listen to that, it's also an online version. Um, but um, but I, I think that's not all that's going on. So I think you know, as, as, as long as we see our investment in science as being about a pipeline that pushes through innovations, then we're going to miss a lot of the tricks that we could be taking advantage of in terms of um, the wider social and economic benefits that come from it. I think that kind of answers the question. Thanks. Uh, one more from there. Um, so Bruce Tether uh, says, congratulations, Karen. We're sorry you can't be here today. And his question is, to what extent do you agree uh, that it would be, a, be better to have separate science and innovation policies rather than science, technology and innovation mashup? Yeah, I, I completely agree. Thanks, Bruce. Um, completely agree with you. And I would go further because I asked the question, what would services innovation policy look like? So I suppose I ought to have a stab at answering it. Um, and I think, I mean, so I think we, we it's horses for courses, really. We need... Um, sector specific and technology specific policies and the idea of generic innovation policy which is about conditions and incentives i think it's run its course uh, I, I think I, I think it's you know there are some basic conditions and things like that that, that will be important but um you know um we, we need policies that are uh, tailored to the dynamics the knowledge dynamics the innovation dynamics the market dynamics um, the, the, the demand, the, 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 the problems and challenges and opportunities of sectors and technologies. So um, very much agree, Bruce, that we should have separate policies, but I, I would go further. Uh, the idea of innovation policy doesn't make sense to me. I, I think we need sector by sector policies uh, on the one hand, and then we need genuine problem oriented policies on the other hand coming at and innovation from, from the, the, the problem side, from the demand side to some extent. Thank you. Khalil? Yeah, thanks, Kim, for an interesting presentation. You mentioned um, R&D expenditure as a percentage of GDP that plans to raise from 1.7 target to 2.4. Mm -hmm. How do you see the impact of that on promoting innovation and I'll take a lot of need firm because you mentioned that that's a big problem. Um, so is it going to help 
yeah. Phil Morrow is that targeted at big sites? So that target, that target in, in, it requires firms to increase their investment. So because that's a, an overall target for public and private investment. So two thirds of that increase has to come from private firms. So the assumption is just as, so we don't know the counterfactual, but you know, more or less precisely at the time that UK government decided to withdraw from large scale applied civil R&D, you know, <laughs> the R&D intensity uh, started to change and decline from being one of the world, world leading levels of R&D investment as a percentage of GDP to uh, this kind of average um, performance that we have. Um, but it requires companies to do their part. You know, the assumption is that public investment will stimulate private investment, whereas back then the, the assumption was the opposite, was that the public investment crowded out the private investment. And we've, we've all seen how that turned out. It just didn't, it doesn't seem to be the case. Now there's good evidence from, from economics research that, that public investment can crowd in um, private investment in energy. It depends again how you do it. And I would also say where you do it. I'm thinking that maybe things like absorptive capacity, which you mentioned mm. there, mm. and that that would be enhanced if, if um, given. The one thing that slightly worries me about about this is that we already produce you know, world class scientists and engineers in, in, in huge numbers in this country. Uh, so the supply of scientists and engineers by itself is not triggering. You know, so that kind of that supply sense is not triggering, um, and there may be all kinds of contingent reasons for that. So we, we essentially export most of the scientists and engineers because they, they come here for the training and then they go back. But um, uh, but nonetheless, that, that's the one thing that worries me a little bit, that the response might not be automatic in a sense from, from the private sector. Stan. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Kieran. Uh, you might have answered this question already, but I'm going to have a second go at it to see if we can tease it out. Uh, I've certainly been struck looking at recent policy statements about how frequently the idea of an innovation ecosystem appears. It's certainly emerged in that literature, mm -hmm. and I think that's very appropriate, fits with your theme of complexity and systems mm -hmm. complexity and so on. But my question to you really is does that make much sense at national level? If all the action is between firms and universities and individuals at a much more micro level, yeah. Yeah. And actually, the focus of an innovation system mm -hmm. is always a set of innovation problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that leads me on to say, well, does this also suggest that in policy terms, we don't devote any near enough attention to the question of how innovation systems are constructed? They're not naturally given, obviously. So where do they come from? Mm -hmm. How do they develop? Mm -hmm. And what happens when they're past their sell by date? Well, those sorts of questions mm -hmm. arise. Mm -hmm. And I think you've touched on that already, but I'd like to hear your view on it. Yeah. Uh, secondly, and finally, an observation that uh, goes back, who will remember this very well, to a Carter and Williams writing in the late 1950s and 60s in Manchester <coughs> about the innovation process, really pioneering work. One of their great themes was not the total number of science and technology, scientists and technologists we mm -hmm. have, but their maldistribution. There are too many in universities and not enough in industries. And especially once you've taken out the high tech industries, there were nowhere near enough scientists and technologists employed in British industry. And that therefore creates the problem that they can't communicate and they can't really participate in the innovation systems. That's really interesting. The second, so maybe just very quickly on the second point, I, I don't want to dis universities. Sitting next to Luke. <laughs> uh, I was actually in infant school when Carlton went into <laughs> But, um, but uh, so I, I think one thing I've, I've been very interested in why the UK's investments, substantial investments in defence technology, didn't seem to generate the same spillovers that the US's substantial investments in defence technology. And because clearly the scale is different. Um, and maybe we made different choices and we, we emphasize platforms rather than, you know. Uh, Jonathan has done a lot of work on this. You know, the, the, perhaps the, the the technologies like the electronics, guidance systems, things like that would have had more sp potential for spillovers. But I wonder whether part of the problem isn't institutional, and a lot of scientists and engineers were locked away in defence research establishments with minimal interaction with scientists and engineers in universities 
also in companies except when they were contracting to, to do specific things. So as so I completely uh, agree that the, the distribution is likely to be an, an issue. On the first point about innovation systems, in our work, we've been very inspired by your notion of temporary innovation systems. And we've been trying to um, think that through a little bit. Um, I think, so I can see the same thing happening to the innovation ecosystem metaphor that happened to the innovation system metaphor. So the innovation system metaphor, uh, 80s and 90s, a, a way of thinking about the importance of links and interactions and complementary institutions in innovation. So to go beyond this kind of narrow linear step-by-step -step view. Um, the problem is that it became a checklist or a recipe kind of thing. And, and, and we've written about that as well. Um, so you go from this, this idea that there's the, the, in, it, the system is a metaphor for understanding the complexity of relations and institutions. So thinking there's an idealized uh, system that you should reproduce and policymakers then just want to check things off on a checklist. And I think that is also happening to the innovation ecosystem. Maybe Luke can comment on this because he's also written a lot about this. Um, in, innovation ecosystems, or at least it's in danger. I mean, I approve of the biological metaphor, but we, we have to remember these things are metaphors and they're not perfect. They're not perfect representations of reality and the map isn't territory. Well, I, I kind of comment that exactly that happened, that the, the, the government in their innovation strategy simplified my diagram to the point of making it nonsense. Yeah. So, <laughs> Uh, I think it's uh, it's really interesting that we're conducting a debate with something written by one of the founders of this school yes. in, in, in this school uh, yes. 70 years later. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so, according to my instructions, it's time <laughs> to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, um... I'm uh, fascinated by that discussion. I was just thinking, oh, well, I'm guilty of talking about ecosystems now. <laughs> but it has become a popular term. And, and it, has, it has its uses. Yeah, it has its uses. And yeah, I found it useful in terms of some discussions that I've had. But really, have also been interested in your general observations about policy making, not least because in our recent lecture that we had with Andy Holding talking about the challenges of having sustained mm. policy making mm. to try and, you mm. know to address big issues and how difficult that, mm. that is and I often think in other areas of policy making we might also have huge fanfare about the announcement about a policy it doesn't quite deliver what everybody expects but then we miss what it might have delivered and we throw yeah. the baby out with the bathwater mm. um, Sometimes, you know, my in my own field around social mobility, for example, a, a huge issue, huge policy interventions over many times, and nothing seems to have worked. And I just wonder if has literally nothing worked, or are there things that have worked, like initially, short start seemed to work before it was rolled out mm -hmm. uh, and, and didn't work so well. So really fascinated by um, all the discussions that we've had there on. Um, on policy making as well, and I will talk to you about um, um, about innovation and, and, and business support, um, and just also talk perhaps use an opportunity later to think about the different dimensions of innovation policy. You'll say they're not aligned, but could they be aligned? Mm -hmm. At the moment, I don't know. Anyway, so you've got my brain whizzing around. <laughs> so I just say, want to say, Kieran, thank you very much for a really interesting talk. Thank you, Luke, uh, for facilitating the discussion. Thank you, all of you here, for your questions, and also thank you to the online audience for, for some other questions. Um, there may well be extra questions that haven't been asked, so we will be exploiting that situation and probably get you to do another blog and addressing those questions in due course. This has been a fantastic wrap up to a whole series of events that we've had this academic year, which is the last one of the year. So again, thank you very much to Kieran. Uh, and um, I hope that you will all join us in next year's programme, which will start in September and October. Uh, but before then, um, join us for a drink in the reception where we can all have further conversations about lots of interesting topics. And to thank Kieran very much and to congratulate him again to his elevation to a professor. Thank you, Kieran.